Well, welcome again to another edition of uh, Thursday Night Live. Uh, I'm back in Sheboygan, Wisconsin. You can probably see the lake behind me. And uh, the waves crashing against the uh, seawall. So it's quite brisk here. It's going to be a very cold weekend. And uh, But the cold doesn't bother me. I'm used to it. So I'm hoping you'll enjoy uh, tonight's lesson. It's very important. I hope you enjoy it. And God bless uh, every one of you. Let's pray. Jesus, I pray, help us to grow. Lord, use us mightily. In Jesus' name, amen. Praise the Lord. <clears throat> we have an interesting study here tonight that you're going to want to pay close attention to. I hope it doesn't take too long. It's called Augustine's Potions. And the two potions I'm going to talk about tonight are sin nature and original sin. Now, I could put the third potion up there, predestination, but predestination is a result of these two doctrines that he taught to the uh, backslidden church of the fourth century. Let's begin by understanding who Augustine is. He's, he was from Hippo, Algeria, northern uh, Africa, 354 A.D. to 430 A.D., he was a Latin Roman theologian. He had two primary roots. His roots were Plotinus's Neoplatonic philosophy and Persian Manichaeism. And we're going to spend most of our time talking about the Manichaeism, things you didn't know about Augustine. His two principal writings were The City of God and Augustine's Confessions. He has four polluting doctrines or potions that he created. Number one is the sin nature. And, of course, bad translations of the New Testament will use this phrase, sin nature, even though it's never uh, stated so in some of the uh, autograph, uh, autographs, nor is it in the King James or the uh, NESB. But you'll find it in the paraphrases because it's a doctrine that comes from a man's mind into interpretation or translation, and that's a bad thing. So four polluting doctrines, sin nature, original sin, just war, and of course many of you don't know about just war, but this was where uh, Charles Colson encouraged George Bush to go to war in Iraq using this doctrine of Augustine called just war, and then finally predestination, the uh, doctrine of Augustine that ended up in John Calvin's mind so uh, strong. Uh, moving on. He was baptized five years after the Council of Constantinople. Recall this was the second council this uh, solidified uh, the doctrine of the Eternal Son and the Trinity, and uh, it was a result of all the uh, division that occurred after the First Council of Nicaea. Uh, the Calvinists see Augustine as the father of their doctrines. In fact, John Calvin admired Augustine to the max. Recall, John Calvin was trained to be a Catholic priest at the University of Paris. He then got involved in the Reformation, wrote the book, The Christian Institutes, where he pontificated his doctrines that he got from Augustine. So Augustine's greatest influences, as I said, was Manichaeism, religion of Persia. That's a dualist religion. And this word dualist, many of you are not familiar with, but I'm going to explain it in just a second. And Neoplatonism, the Plotinus school. Plotinus was a uh, preacher of philosophy in the Middle East, uh, in the Levant, uh, during the uh, third century. And uh, he was a... Uh, person who was schooled in Neoplatonism, very influential in the uh, backslidden church after the apostles. It was not a Jewish hermeneutic, it was a Greek hermeneutic that still exists today in most churches. So let's talk about the Manichaeism religion. It's a dualist religion, and that means they believe in two equal gods, a god of good and a god of evil. And these two gods are in some sort of a uh, dual, and neither of them win. One overcomes the other at different times. So one is the god of light, that would be the god of goodness, and one is the god of darkness, the god of evil. So a Persian mystic named Mani, Manichaeism, get it? He received light revelations from age 12 to 24. Sounds a lot like Muhammad, doesn't it? He died in 276 AD. And uh, he's very much like Joseph Smith of Mormon fame. He wrote the Manny Codex, just like Joseph Smith wrote the Book of Mormon, a complete work of fiction. And Manichaeism incorporates elements of Buddhism, Zoroastrianism, and Gnostic Christianity. This was the uh, fake Christianity that was rising even during the time of John the Apostle. 
Gnosis means special knowledge. These people believe they had a special knowledge about Christianity and Jesus, and they uh, detoured far away from Scripture and the Holy Spirit. Sin nature doctrine was a, separate, a central tenet of Manichaeism. Man has an evil and a good quality within him. And of course, sin nature goes right here with the evil nature that uh, would come out of Manichaeism. So it's no surprise that Augustine would create this doctrine of sin nature because he was a Manichaeist first before he became a Christian. And uh, he was a philosopher first before he became a Christian as well. And uh, those were his roots. So you have to understand where this doctrine came from. And it's even ended up in some of our paraphrase Bibles today, like the NIV, because people believe this doctrine, even though they've never studied it. So the Manichaeism religion does not match with Judaism. Judaism does never and never teaches sin nature or dualist natures of good and evil within man or that there are two gods. Uh, many people believe that Satan is God's equal. He is not. He is just one fallen angel. Okay? He is not God's equal. God is omnipresent. He is omniscient. Uh, God is good. Satan has none of those characteristics. Augustine interpreted uh, Paul's law of sin writings as dualist. Uh, Romans 5, 7, and 8. Actually, it goes to Romans 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, and 9. All those chapters. And uh, Augustine and John Calvin saw that the law of sin was, in essence, a sinful nature. And nothing could be further from the truth. So the result of the sin nature doctrine is this that infants must be baptized to remove their sins since they are born sinful. And this, of course, results in a predestination doctrine that people are predestined to be uh, sinners, that they have no choice in the matter, and uh, you can see where that comes from. It's a, it's a determinist uh, philosophy. Uh, determinism comes straight out of Neoplatonism as well as Manichaeism. It's a result of both. So people pass original sin down to the, their reproductive chain, to their offspring. And uh, we know that this is not true, but this is the true belief of somebody who believes in the sin nature and original sin. So their beliefs are that Mary did not pass her dual nature to Jesus, else Jesus could not be a sinless offering. He would have had to have a sinful nature. And people wrestle and wrestle and wrestle with this because the sin nature doctrine is not from God. It was invented by Augustine. That's why they struggle with this deal right here. Therefore, God planted an in vitro fertilized zygote into her womb. Fully God, no humanity from Mary at all. This is where the divine flesh doctrine comes from. It comes straight from Augustine and John Calvin, the doctrine of sin nature and the doctrine of original sin, which leads to the doctrine of predestination. Bada bing, bada bing, bada bing. So Mary then is considered divine, the mother of God, without a sin nature. Well, that's interesting, isn't it? I'm sure somewhere along the line she got tired one day and maybe she even cursed out her husband. Who knows? <laughs> Hit her finger with, a, with a, a hammer and said, ouch, and a curse word came out of her mouth. Maybe she told a lie as a young girl. Mary was not divine. Do not pray to her. She's not the mother of God. She's the mother of the man, Jesus Christ. She passed on uh, 23 of her chromosomes to Jesus just as God the Father passed on 23 chromosomes Jesus is fully God and man. What makes Jesus divine is that the word was made or manufactured into his flesh, uh, not because of his genetics. Genetics has nothing to do with your nature. It has nothing to do with Jesus Christ being divine. It was the word that was made flesh in John chapter 1, verse 14. Uh, the word was made flesh. That's what makes Jesus divine, nothing else. Remember, Adam was the first son of God. God gave him all 46 chromosomes. Okay? Your chromosomes do not make you sinful. They do not make you holy. Either one. It's the decisions that you make. And Jesus, of course, was the son of God as well. But he had a human mother and a divine father. He got 23 chromosomes from Mary and 23 from God. Those 46 chromosomes have nothing to do with his nature. Nothing. The word was made flesh. That is the divinity that was in Christ, to wit, God was in Christ, reconciling the world unto himself. The uh, humanity of Jesus Christ came from his mother and his father. Yes, God put 23 chromosomes into the, the, into the uh, zygote, into the egg, and fertilized it. And Jesus is a human being with 46 chromosomes. Chromosomes neither make you sinful nor make you holy, neither one. 
So here we go. Augustine, Luther, Calvin, and Muhammad. All four of them are tied together. None of them were spirit-filled. All believed the doctrine of predestination. And the Muslims say, Inshallah, God wills it. <laughs> and, of course, this is a, a complete uh, isolated exegesis of Scripture. And we're going to talk about that if we get a little time at the end of this study. So we have to talk about the law of sin versus the act of sin. So Paul talks about the law of sin, and it's equivalent to the law of gravity. If you jump off a chair, you're going to hit the ground. If you enter into the earth as a human being, the law of sin is going to be represented in your mind. The law of sin exists, and it causes physical death, but it does not cause eternal judgment or the second death, spiritual death. The law of sin only causes physical death. No matter how much they manipulate our DNA and try to get us to live longer and longer, the law of sin will make sure that we die a physical death, but not necessarily a spiritual death. Spiritual death is caused by the act of sin. That's what causes the second death. And the act of sin is a decision based on a decision. Now, I want you to note that there's two additional sins that are not actions, but they are thought crimes. Coveting, coveting your neighbor's wife, his donkey, his, his house, his, his land, and a heart of adultery, thinking upon a woman with lust. Jesus added that one as a thought crime. Those are two thought sins, crimes without actions. So it's our actions of sin, stealing, cheating, uh, lying. Those are actions of sin. That sends us to the second death. And of course, coveting and the heart of adultery those two thought crimes are added to the actions of sin that sends us to the second death, spiritual death. That's the law of sin versus the act of sin. And it's important to understand and distinguish the two. So we keep going. Adam permitted the law of sin to flood his thoughts. In other words, he always had the choice to act on those thoughts or to dwell on those thoughts. He never had to. Up until this time, the law of sin never flooded his brain. He never had to consider those things, but he came to know good and he came to know evil. And if you want to talk about dualism, there it is, two different thoughts of access to the man's mind. Adam was given only one law by God, don't eat from the knowing tree. Now, if he disobeyed this law, he was warned that he would die. Knowing good and evil is a curse. See, knowing evil is what causes our bodies to die. It's the thoughts. That's what actually destroys us physically. So when Adam disobeyed, immediately the law of members, Paul calls it the law of members, but also the law of sin, it invaded his garden, his biosphere, his environment, his universe, and it contaminated his thought environment of his soul. Prior to this point, Adam never had a sinful thought until he disobeyed, allowing the thoughts of evil to permeate the garden. So... This law has invaded man's world, bringing an alien companion with it, a curse. And the curse is existence outside the garden environment. In the garden, there are no thoughts of evil. But outside of it, the curse, the law of sin, permeates our thinking. You know, that's why people say we need to outlaw guns or outlaw this, that, and the other. No gun ever killed anybody. It was simply a decision behind the gun. That's what killed somebody. So, we get the death penalty phys physically for knowing good and evil. However, we get the hell penalty for acting, for doing evil without salvation. See, it's here that Jesus Christ came to deliver us and save us. He can't stop this. This has already been done. But this is why he came, to keep us from going to hell and paying for our own actions. He paid for them on his cross. That's a good thing. Praise the Lord for that. I'm just going to read some of these scriptures here that will help reinforce this. I, I can't possibly read every scripture on this particular teaching. It would just take too long. So I'm trying to keep this under 30 minutes tonight. Therefore, just as sin came into the world through one man, and death through sin, talking about physical death, and so death spread to or contaminated all men because all sin. When the Bible says all sin, it's simply saying that our sin environment, our thoughts, have entered into our mind. It doesn't mean you've actually taken an action of sin. And that's where the big confusion was by Luther and Calvin and Augustine. They didn't have the Holy Ghost. It's clear they didn't understand. 
And then John says, whoever commits sins transgresses the law, for sin is the transgression or disobedience to the law. And without a law, there is no sin. So until the law of Moses came, all those sins that are identified by that law, okay, were not sin. Isn't that interesting? There has to be laws defining what is and is not a sin. Of course, we have the law of conscience as well. Timothy said this, uh, or actually Paul said it to Timothy, that Adam was not deceived in the transgression. In other words, he decided that he wanted the wisdom the devil told him about. What wisdom did he want? It's my belief. He wanted, to, he wanted omniscience. He wanted to see the future. And that was the forbidden fruit. He, uh, what he got by disobeying was he got the knowledge of good and evil, not just good. Bad deal. So the law of sin, Paul also calls this the law of members, is impossible, Paul says, for humans to control within our own strength and willpower. Let me say that again. The law of members that dwells in our flesh, this law is impossible for humans to control within our own strength and willpower. Scripture teaches us that there are two twin aspects of the law, the law of members, lust and pride. These cannot be controlled without help. That's the problem, is that the help was removed by Adam, okay? So lust of the eyes and flesh and the pride of life. Here they are, the two twin impulses, the law of members, lust and pride. If we don't pray against temptation, lust and pride will activate, causing us to decide to sin. And that's what Paul teaches. So the law of sin versus the act of sin is dead chain thinking. Scripture notes two forms of death, as I said, a physical death and eternal death. Physical death is caused by the entrance of the law of sin into man's universe, our environment. Eternal death is caused by the transgression of God's laws through actions. These actions are the result of sin thinking, the law of sin thinking. Dead uh, they're activated by unresisted temptation. If we don't resist temptation through prayer, the law of sin thinking will permeate our brains and eventually one of those thoughts will grab us and we will decide to act. Now, when you say that we have a sin nature, that's dead chain thinking. Dead chain thinking. So, Paul says this, I see another law in my members, warring against the law of my mind, and bringing me into captivity to the law of sin, which is in my members. So then, with the mind I myself serve the law of God, but with my flesh the law of sin. What Paul is saying is that flesh cannot stop us from making bad decisions. It's, there's no power within ourselves to stop it. We need the spirit of Jesus Christ. So, the dead chain thinking of Augustine and Calvin is an error that says we have a sin nature. We do not. We simply live in a sinful biosphere. It's like the law of gravity. You <laughs> can't get away from it, at least not until we get back in the garden. So, death occurs three ways for us. Number one, in our mind. When we transgress the law in our mind, condemnation comes, guilt, shame, self-loathing, which is wrong thinking, depression, mental illness, and fear. I would also say that there's a thing called moral illness. A lot of people uh, believe they're mentally ill when in fact they are morally ill. The body, we have physical disease, bodily malfunction, genetic flaw, deformed self-healing processes, our bodies age under the law of sin. And then our soul, that's eternal judgment, prison, captivity, punishment forever. It's our mind and body that are affected by the law of sin. Okay? The act of sin is what affects this right here. So the law of sin is just like the law of gravity. It's inescapable. It's an unavoidable knowing. Don't be surprised if you get some nasty thoughts. Because the law of knowing good and evil exists. The law of sin. It's what we decide to do with those thoughts. The Bible says to take every thought into captivity, whatever is lovely, whatever is pure, think on these things. Uh, the Holy Ghost is all about controlling our thoughts and giving us an evil, even keel. It says this in Genesis 3, 7 through 8, And the eyes of both of them, Adam and Eve, were opened. They knew that they were naked. Adam and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God amongst the trees of the garden. Do you see how that affected the act of sin affected their mind? And, of course, their body, eventually they got old and they died. So the origins of Christian predestination are from Augustine came the doctrine of original sin, sin nature, 
and from Calvin came this idea of total depravity of human nature, which is the first uh, uh, element of his tulip doctrine, total depravity, which is totally wrong and total nonsense. I'm here to declare it today. So the sin nature goes, takes us to original sin, to total depravity. Augustine's doctrine of sin nature also created the Catholic doctrine of original sin as well. Note that in Judaism, Cain did not repent for his father's sins, only his own. Now, Cain murdered his brother, but he never repented for Adam's sin. And that's where this doctrine of original sin and sin nature take us, is that we end up having to repent for things that we did not do. And the key word is do. We simply die because the law of sin is in our biosphere. It's in our universe. It's destroying the cells in our body. Here's what Ezekiel said, Ezekiel 18, 20. And this scripture here defeats the doctrine of original sin and sin nature. It says this, the soul who sins shall die. Notice that's an action, who sins shall die. The son shall not suffer for the iniquity of the father. In other words, Cain does not pay for Adam's sin. Nor does the father suffer for the iniquity of the son. The righteousness of the righteous shall be upon himself, and the wickedness of the wicked shall be upon himself. What's this saying? You decide to take actions of sin. The law of sin does not make you a sinner. What about all have sinned and fallen short of God's glory? Oh yeah, I remember that verse. It simply means that all live in the, the sin bios biosphere. Sin thoughts have access to our minds. That's what it's talking about. Isn't the heart deceitful and wicked? You know, the heart's deceitful and wicked. Who can know it, Jeremiah said. Well, the answer is, is that thoughts that enter into the heart can be deceitful and wicked. But not all thoughts are deceitful and wicked in the heart. I mean, we need, to, we need to look at all the scriptures, not just one or two or three in isolation. So that's isolated exegesis, which creates biblical errors. Thank you, John Calvin. Thank you, Augustine. Thank you, Luther. Noah was declared by scripture to be a righteous man. Job was declared to be a righteous man. Josiah was declared to be a righteous king. And so the Jews answered this issue of sin nature saying, hey, there's some guys <laughs> who don't have a sin nature by scripture. And the scripture cannot be abrogated. If we have a sin nature and God predestined some of us to be saved and some of us to be lost, then guess what? God's a monster. He's not just. So if people are telling you that God gave you a sin nature and an original sin and you're predisposed to be a sinner and I'm predisposed to be a saint, what kind of God is that? He made all the choices. How would God find fault? Well, it's ridiculous. When Paul asked that question, he was saying, I don't understand God. Praise the Lord. There's some things that cannot be explained about God. I think Paul understood that. What about Pharaoh? Didn't God harden his heart? Isn't that predestination? Doesn't God give us a choice? Hey, listen, Pharaoh was predisposed to enslave the Hebrews. He didn't want to work and neither did the people in Egypt. They wanted them Hebrews to do all the work. He's a straw boss. Do as I say, not as I do. So God sent 10 judgments. They were intended not to deliver Israel, but to harden Pharaoh's heart further. Hard preaching hardens hearts. Never think that it softens people. It does not. Hard preaching hardens hearts. And Pharaoh's heart got hard. And God sent ten plagues. He knew full well that Pharaoh would get harder and harder by the judgments, the plagues. Because what he wanted to do was to make an example out of Pharaoh. And God certainly had the right to do that. Uh, he destroyed his army. He destroyed his kingdom. So, how do we defeat the law of sin? We talked about it tonight. If we can't defeat it in our own strength, are we responsible for what we can't defeat and its effect on us? Well, in one sense, no. Only, in Adam, only Adam and Eve needed to repent for contaminating their offspring with the law of sin that came into the environment. Now notice, this answer that I gave right here totally destroys the Catholic and Calvinist reason for baptizing infants result of errant original sin doctrine. Adam and Eve were the only ones who needed to repent for eating the fruit that gave them knowledge of good and evil. I've never had to repent of it. Have you? Of course not. That's ridiculous. But that's what the doctrine of sin, original sin and sin nature says, that we have to repent for Adam and Eve's sins because we have a sinful nature. That's hogwash. 
I'll repent for my own sins, thank you, which I have had plenty that I've done, okay? But thinking sin is not doing sin. There's a difference. Thinking sin is what destroys our bodies and causes us to die. The soul that sinneth, it shall die. When it says that, it's talking about the contaminated environment. It's almost like we have a toxic chemical in our environment, sin thoughts. But in another sense, yes, if we can't defeat the law of sin, are we responsible? Yes, in this sense. If we yield our members to the law of sin, that is, we make a mental decision not to resist the desires of lust and pride, then we are complicit and responsible. Now notice, prayer is the only way to make the way of escape, but you still got to decide to escape. Prayer makes the way to escape. Temptation is going to come. And when it comes, it's going to activate our lust or it's going to activate our pride. But prayer, prayer makes the way of escape obvious to us and we can make the right choice to escape that decision. So yes, we are responsible for the law of sin, but we need some help. That's why we need the Holy Ghost. After sinning, our conscience, which is the law of our mind, bears witness that we need cleansing, repentance, and relief that only God can provide. God alone grants repentance. Many people think they can just go to God and get repentance. Esau sought repentance with tears, but God did not grant it to him, and God has a reason for that. So, defeating the law of sin. This is what Paul tells us. Don't yield your members as instruments of unrighteousness unto sin, but yield yourself unto God as those that are alive from the dead and your members as instruments of righteousness unto God. For sin shall not have dominion over you, for you are not under the law, but under grace. He's talking about the Holy Ghost, the Acts 2.38 plan of salvation, which is making grace and power available to us. You're under grace. What then? Shall we sin because we're not under the law, but under grace? God forbid. What he's saying is that the law was buried with us in baptism. And where there's no law, there's no sin. How about that? Sin does not have dominion over us, not over our thinking. Unless we willfully sin, then our conscience will tell us, hey, you need to repent. <laughs> know ye not to whom you yield yourselves, your servants to obey? Notice that key word, obey and yield. This is all related to a decision. His servants ye are to whom you obey, whether of sin unto death or of obedience unto righteousness. And of course, he's talking about second death here. God has made it possible for us to decide to defeat the law of sin through the power of the Holy Ghost, through prayer, making the way of escape. So, yielding is a decision. We strengthen that decision with prayer, reading the scripture, and the Holy Ghost. Augustine's Potions, Original Sin and Sin Nature, and that's where I'm going to stop tonight. And... Uh, I just wanted to say, I know it's a little bit of a, a difficult lesson. You, uh, I couldn't put everything in here about this particular topic, but I do have a couple articles on my website. I encourage you to read them, uh, especially the one on uh, Jean Calvin, and uh, take a look at that one. Study it. It's a little bit of a book. I've got another one I'm going to post here shortly. So it's an important for us to understand. When you read in one of these paraphrased Bibles, Sin Nature, that's a complete fabrication, bad translation. Get rid of it. Get that NASB out, the old King James, the modern King James. You won't read that in there. You'll read about the law of sin, the law of members that's in our flesh. And uh, you'll get some better exegesis there. I'm not criticizing the usefulness of some of those Bibles. They can be useful by putting things into plainer English. But when somebody takes a doctrine of man and puts it into the scripture, he's removed his name from the book of life. God bless you tonight. I hope you enjoyed the study. and We'll see you next time on another edition of 153 Great Fish as we shake the foundations.